Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil's specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. With senior year coming to a close and graduation on the horizon, four teens head out for one final night as high schoolers. Writer-director Jager Moore makes his feature film debut with Never Be Content, tonight on the Four Seasons of Film podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Four Seasons of Film podcast. Nathan Robert Blackburn here. It's a very special podcast. We like to bring you the week before the Oscars and all the melee and mayhem that they're causing in the news. We would highlight someone that is not in the mainstream media press and someone who is very near and dear to our hearts, filmmaker Jager Moore, who's always been a big proponent of our podcast and the work that we have done in the San Francisco Bay Area. Very talented young man, directed a film called Never Be Content, his feature film debut. We were fortunate enough to see this in early screenings. Um, Jager brought it over to our house, and we all actually had a private screening for his first cut, which uh, we, we, we love doing with young filmmakers especially. And nothing short of raw talent in this young man. His future is very bright, having written, directed, and starring in this film. He captures something about the high school ex- experience, And the adolescent experience, you know, I would only equate to other films like uh, Days and Confused, uh, Everybody Wants Some, even, you know, if you go back to American Graffiti, I think it has, Never Be Content has that same kind of feel to it where anybody and everyone that went through adolescence can relate to this film, even if you didn't necessarily go to this high school or go to high school in general, and especially even in, in the United States, being a teenager and facing you know, the uh, the world that's coming at you like a meteor when you finally do decide that you're going to grow up at that pivotal age. That's what this film is really all about. And it, it just um, it just touched us all, especially to know and work with him. And uh, we wanted to bring this uh, special interview between himself and me that we recorded right after the premiere. He, um, he had a nice little premiere. He, he had a sold out premiere, actually at the uh, Arinda Theater, and he was fortunate enough to uh, to get to, to see the reaction for his first film in front of a large audience that came out to support him. A lot of people that had uh, helped uh, fund the film, starred in the film, gave him locations, actors, and it was, it was such a great turnout. And we were there, of course, to support him. Um, but he has another... Well, the reason we're doing this podcast, too, is he has another screening of this film that we wanted to promote for him at Diablo Valley College in Pleasant Hill, California, on March 14th at 7 p.m. Um, I think it's a free event. If not, you can go to uh, DVC's uh, website, but I believe it's a free event. So if the last screening is any indication, please arrive early, but support uh, local artists, especially for those of us living in San Francisco and San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Jager Moore is a dynamo and a force to be reckoned with and never be content. One of those first features that you'll you'll watch and think, boy, I'm glad that I, uh, I know this guy because I can see him uh, going on to to bigger and better things almost immediately. And him and I had a really great talk about filmmaking in general, uh, the process of making Never Be Content, sort of his his film philosophy, his life, where he came from, and where he plans to go. So uh, without further ado, here's my conversation with Jager Moore about his film Never Be Content. First, really wanted to talk to you about your movie. You know, somebody said that after the premiere when I was leaving, nobody's ever made a movie about Martinez before. Mm-hmm. Is it true? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, set in Martinez, about Martinez. I've I've wanted to make one for a while, and I don't know if I've ever heard of anybody else, because I know there's a lot of artists and filmmakers in Martinez, but I don't know if anybody ever made one with this this place in mind, or if they actually made it about it instead of making it here, right? Um, but they, I mean, they filmed that uh, Thirteen Reasons Why show yeah. downtown once, right, yeah. or something like that. So it's been featured, I would think, you know, because mm-hmm. I, you know, I never seen that show. Have, you, you are, you were obviously in it though. I was in the first season as an extra. Yeah. How was that like? You told me a little bit about it, but take me back through that. That sounds that was that was pretty cool. Uh, I worked in a movie theater, and then one of my friends told me about it. Uh, she was working as a 
as a assistant for like the casting department or something along those lines. And then I, she asked me if I wanted to do it. So I submitted my headshots and stuff cause I'd never done anything like that before. And I really wanted to get into acting and like everybody back then I was like, Oh, like, you know, if I'm an extra in a show, maybe they'll see me and then yeah, they want to yeah. put me in like a feature role. Like, I did the same thing for Herbie Reloaded. Oh. I lived in Los Angeles. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking 2004, about. 2004, I'm like, I could do this. They're going to spot me out of the crowd. Yeah, it's like, I'm going to cheer louder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> totally didn't work. I have a nice looking face like they're gonna want me to talk and stuff. right 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 so i did that and they signed me up for, i signed up for it to be full-time because you could have done it like if you wanted to do like a day or two you could have but i was okay. like no i want to like i want to meet people and get my name out there and like get like a good good brand for myself working with people there even though i'm just an extra like bottom of the barrel uh i wanted to have like a good work ethic so i want to do the whole season and so i did and i learned a lot about filmmaking doing that because that was my that was my first time like really on a professional set like I PA'd on a set before in Southern California once and that was a re really good learning experience but on this one I could really sit down and watch people direct um, I'm trying to remember what the director's name was he directed Spotlight oh okay yeah um, yeah but he, I watched him direct he was directing the first two episodes he did uh, he directed of 13 Reasons Why the first two episodes, oh, yeah. Oh, wow, cool. Yeah. And I was just watching him direct and stuff and watching all the departments do their thing because, you know, I know I knew a lot went into making movies. Tom I McCarthy? Had, yeah, Tom, Tom McCarthy. Tom McCarthy, yeah. I, I watched him direct a lot of uh, a lot of it, and I learned a lot from it. And it was, it was a really cool learning experience, but it was also, like, a really hard experience because, you know, like, I wasn't used to the schedule, and it was, like, a long drive to go to there. Cause, yeah, like, they were filming Sebastopol. Sebastopol. Yeah. So that was, like, far off. Had you ever been there before? I had, like, but not, like, to stay. Uh, I've driven through there and stuff, but um, I wanted to uh, go out there and learn how to do all that stuff, so I did. And, and then as the months progressed, like, it kind of became, like, a grind, and it was, like one of those things where it's like once you knew that like you weren't gonna be like a big movie star from being yeah. an extra like, like day one yeah <laughs> yeah like day one yeah <laughs> you show up and you're like oh this isn't what i thought it was gonna be right you're but, like where's my merit badge yeah yeah it was still really fun and cool but Shit, um, yeah you're on a film set i yeah. mean no matter what it's professional it's got g tons of money behind it you know i mm -hmm. mean it's it's the real deal and it's a show that people care about. Yeah. I, I mean, I've never seen it, but yeah. I always felt bad about not seeing it because you were in it, number one. <laughs> and everybody, I mean, I remember bringing it up to someone and, you know, I went, you know, what is the show about? I mean, it was like this older guy who you never would have guessed he would be into that sort of thing. And I didn't even know it was 13 Reasons Why Suicide. You know, I, yeah. I didn't even put that together. I just heard the name. Mm -hmm. So I asked him and he like got real serious, looked me dead in the face and was like, it's about suicide. I was like, holy <laughs> shit, okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is more serious than I thought it was. I thought it was a high school show. It yeah. is. But, you know, in that very serious way. But that's cool. You were So you're an extra... And you got to meet Tom McCarthy, you said, right? And, yeah, I talked and to, talk him to him a and, little bit. Yeah, yeah. And but more, but you you chose to like uh, observe. Yeah, the, I mean, the I process. Wanted, like you, there was like you know the extras and stuff, and you hung out with them most of the time. But like, I didn't really make a lot of friends with the extras just because like it wasn't really my scene. Well, you know, right. There's a lot of people competing for attention, and you'll find that a lot on film sets if you do decide to be an extra. Right. And everybody thinks that they're going to be famous on there, so everybody's kind of cutthroat about it. And so I kind of chose to just try and study the crew and everybody and see how they did it and befriend the crew because right. I like talking to them more. Most of the time they didn't have time to talk, but when they did, it was really interesting, like during lunch or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided to do that and just isolate myself and hang out with the crew. And I got to like hang out with the script supervisor and like the assistant directors and they were all really cool. But the extras were very cutthroat. Yeah, in, in you find show. that it it's the weirdest business in that way where you can get on a film set but it's it's kind of like well what's the price you're going to pay to be on that film set you're gonna yeah. you do what you do and you you want to observe and do the the positions and talk to you know, certain people on the crew that's the smartest way to do it mm -hmm. you know the, the extras are all sitting there and it's kind of just like a big high school click thing you know it's mm -hmm. who uh, whoever has the most shit on their reel or your you know who has a headshot who doesn't have yeah. a headshot yeah that that would drive me absolutely crazy to be on a on a, a film set like that again and just be one of the extras yeah and now having made a film i doubt you'll ever do that again 
<laughs> I, I mean, I got invited to do season two, but I made a movie instead. That's what you got to yeah. do. That's absolutely what you have to do. Take me back to like the what what got you into this whole film deal? How early was it? Inspirations, the whole deal. Where are you from? You know, what's what's your story? I'm from Martinez, California, and I grew up here, and I'm still here right now. Small town in the East San Francisco Bay. Born and bred. That's Born crazy. and bred on yeah. Main Street. Yeah. Dude. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. I was always like, I liked movies and stuff, and growing up, like, I knew I always wanted to do something, like, with that. Like, I always played with toys when I was younger, and I right. liked to tell stories with, like, the army men and stuff. Sure, like, yeah. Whether it was Star Wars or whatever, like, I really liked telling stories with those figures and then i my mom had a camera and uh, i just started playing with it and uh, made like stuffed animal movies and stuff and stuffed animals like going to war with how, each other how old were you when you started doing that probably like eight oh nine. wow so okay young. so for the old guy in the room uh when you start picking up the camera what kind of camera was this it was a tape tape camera like a vhs Sony. camera yeah no shit. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking my generation. This is great. Yeah, well, it was a tape. I don't know if it was VHS because it was smaller, but it had a tape in it. Okay. So, like, if Maybe you were like record- high eight, but before that. But if you recorded over footage, it was gone forever. Okay, so it's, it's essentially so, like VHS. Yeah. Like, I think yeah. you had to take it to like a Walgreens or something for them to convert it to a VHS. Wow, that's so yeah. cool. Okay, cool. But, so you've been through what I've been through. I yeah. can relate to this. Yeah. So it was like one of those cameras where you did the editing while you were filming. Right. So, like, right. I did, I did that for like I made like four or five of those videos and and then I got my own little hundred dollar camera from Walmart for a birthday one year and then me and my friend just started going to town. I uploaded like I think when I stopped making YouTube videos back then, like early days of YouTube, I had like two hundred and thirty videos. And Holy shit! We were just making. She everything. just put everything and put it out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, it was just fun. Like I I I loved watching like these kids make videos on the internet. So I was like. I want to make my own. So, like, we had, like, a lot of action movies. And, like, yeah, we yeah. had, like, a long-running series where, like, me and my friend are, like, babysitting. And, like, there's this, like, squad of people who, like, want to kidnap the baby and we always kill them. Like, it was, <laughs> like, it was weird ideas. But I did that for a lot of years. And then I stopped in junior high school because, you know, I was like, well, I'm too cool to do this type of thing. I was going through right. some phases and stuff. And then when I got to high school, I was appreciating movies a lot more. I think I was... In, more like eighth grade, I watched this one movie, uh, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. And I fell in love with that movie because like, I was really into westerns and that was a movie that I put off for a long time. Right. And I don't know why, but I just really liked that movie from like the minute I saw it, everything about the atmosphere, the dialogue, everything, the way it unraveled. Like, I fell in love with that movie and that made me want to make movies. It was like the first time it really hit you yeah. that like movies could be done this way mm-hmm. and and it really resonated with you how good it was. It was the first movie that really yeah. ever made me cry. Yeah. Like and I, I what cried. Part? I really sympathize with like uh, Casey Affleck's character. Okay, right. And because um, he's a he's he's there's this weakness about him. Yeah. Even and it's I mean it's in the title obviously, but he is the coward Robert Ford. And he's going through this thing, and it's not really about Jesse James as much as it is, it, it is about him. You feel like he didn't deserve what he got, right? You know, like right. he's put in a situation and he reacted to it. And I think like all of us would have reacted a certain way in that situation. And I really liked that it was had so many layers that I could think about like that. And I watched it like seven or eight times and noticed new things about it, and new yeah. things in the story. And I liked that a lot. And that was like back when like Blockbuster first started closing down. So ah, I was like yeah. watching a lot of movies. I remember a that. A lot of movies. So like yeah. the Blockbuster in town closed. I had to go over to town over to get movies and stuff. So I was watching a lot. And then I was just like, all right, I guess this is what I want to do because I was never much of a student in school. Like yeah. I uh, I was probably the worst student at Alhambra <laughs> High School f- for, for my time. The staff can probably agree with me on that. I, I, academically. Okay. I was okay, a good right, kid, like right. not academically, but. Like you weren't just like spray painting the no. school and shit like that. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't do, I didn't show up very often and I didn't do homework. I just kind of hung out and right. had a good time. And right. That was what high school was like for me. Like I had a really fun time. No film club or anything like that in, in high school? I, film classes? I don't think there was. I mean, there. I knew you don't there was know. some people. I don't think there was. That's awesome. <laughs> I didn't hang around that long. See, but... I was begging for it. I knew there was, and I was just so pissed off. You're like, I don't know there was. <laughs> I don't. That's funny. Could have been. There was a film festival last year I was there. That's when it started picking up on the film a lot. All right, more. right. I went to community college right after. Okay, so, so there you go. 
um, I guess not. I wasn't really taking like you know like general education classes. I was taking like screenwriting and stuff and trying to get into that and see what college life was like. Oh, okay, it yeah, was pretty fun. You're kind of like auditing classes then, right? You're not like a student student. You were like, yeah, oh, I'll like, show up to this one, show up to this one. Exactly. Yeah, like, I was just there to kind of do what I wanted to do because the problem with high school is I was learning about things that I really wasn't interested. in. Oh, I know what you mean. So like, most artists are like that, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, if do you really want to learn calculus and algebra and all that stuff? Yeah. Sometimes it's practical if you're interested in it, but I even, I mean, I was a good student and I even found myself so bored Mm -hmm. by school in general, Yeah, you know, so that's why, I mean, I just joined everything I could that was in the arts just just for something. And, you know, a lot of these people that brag to me that, yeah, I had a film club, right, a photo club and this kind of thing. It's like, well, I had to make these clubs (laughs) in high school because they didn't exist where I went to high school. So it was really just like-minded people would get together generally it would be you would try to talk your friends into being more film buffs than they than they wanted to yeah. be or they knew they they would most and then, people are and they just don't right, know it. they don't know it yeah and then you would weed out the ones who really weren't that interested and then some people would rise to like the top of the the water and you'd be like oh the there's one that's man. He's he really wants to do this, just like yeah. me. And you know, hopefully you get that one or two people. But I don't know what your experience was like if you had those friends or I not. Got, I got I had those friends. I just didn't know I had them in high school. So right, like, right. I wish I would have started a film club, or if there was a film club, I wish I would have been a part of it. Yeah, I don't know yeah, what yeah. the situation was, but no, uh, it's all right. I honestly think I had the best time I could have possibly had in those years. Like badass. If I did any different i don't think i would be nearly as like have the as good of memories and be as happy as i am right now and be on the path that i'm on like i'm really sure about what i want to do because of that stuff and i've always right. been really sure i never second guessed it so but what was the driving force you know to kind of say you know you chose you want to do this but did anything did anyone or anybody you know say yes do this and this is what you should be doing. Did, did anyone give you encouragement along the way? Her name was Miss Dawson. She uh, she was always encouraging me. And then her son was in the filmmaking, Austin. He's my good friend now. And uh, he ended up mentoring me, giving me all these books. And like he pretty much took me from I was at the bottom and then helped educate me. And he still is. Like yeah. to this day, he's still teaching me all this different stuff. And like he took me down to L.A. to P.A. for this commercial that we did and stuff. So there was a lot of people there that helped uh helped um encourage me to do this stuff and i mean like you know they understood that i went about it my own different way and you know like not everybody can fit into this mold like you can go to school and stuff right and, right what was austin's background in, in film i can't remember all of it off the top of my head but yeah. i i know that he was from martinez and that he was kind of like a lot like me like he always liked making movies and he went to film school and like that's what he's just trying to do now he's right. trying to do film and stuff and like now we're being able to work together and stuff and did he work on uh, never be content other. he helped me a lot when it came to the writing yeah he always has been like really honest with if my stuff sucks right so if my writing wasn't good i'd send my script over to him and he'd help fix it and then when the when it was done like i'd send edits over to him and show him edits and then he'd look at it and tell me what worked and what didn't and stuff. god that friend is invaluable yeah. isn't it i mean not the friend that tells you everything yeah. oh this is great like the you friend that needs tells you, no, somebody you, yeah like that and they you yeah. know to if everybody would just be more honest about your work life would be a whole lot easier and it sounds like the reverse you know it's like well if everybody had an opinion then i wouldn't know what to write but it's it's actually no you can you can take all those opinions and choose what you want to do yeah. because this is your project. But isn't it? It's I find it so refreshing when somebody says, "I didn't think it was funny," or yeah. "I think this part was no good." Mm-hmm. You know, and also you got to avoid those assholes that are like, "I think it sucked. Why? I it just sucked. Yeah, or it was good. Yeah. Why does it good?" It has to be constructive. Yeah. So okay, well, it can't just be all or nothing. Let's let's get in the minutia of these ideas. Yeah. And Austin was like, didn't, "Have I met him before?" You might have. Maybe. I'm not sure. Um, he he wasn't at the premiere because he had a, a concert that night. He's mm-hmm. a he's a musician. Oh, okay. But he really pushed me to make stuff, and I really just wanted to make bigger things than I was. And I made like my first actual film in high school, my senior year. Like I said, I decided to do filmmaking sophomore year, but everything up until like the end of my senior year, I was like kind of just like not doing anything right i was like studying and i was being procrastinating and wasn't doing anything I, I guess i was i could say like i was thinking of ideas for the future but sure there was a film festival that this one person put together in high school and i was like all right well you know what 
I might as well just do this. So I did, and uh, I had a good friend, Joe Little, who I was talking to, and I still do. He's my filmmaking friend. Uh, we help come up with stories together and stuff. Um, he, we were coming up with, trying to just come up with good ideas for like, you know, a 10 minute short film that we could do. And we did, we came up with this story about like a kid who runs another high school or over and he tries to hide it. And, <laughs> and we shot that in like, I think three days. And that was my first time, like, trying to make something, like, watchable. This was the, for the film festival. For the film festival yeah, at yeah, Alhambra yeah. High School. Yeah. Right. And and then we made it, and I was so stoked about it when, it when it was, like, done. Like, I was like, this is, like, the best thing ever. Right. Like, this is awesome. And and then I put it into the film festival, and there was, like, three other entries. So, like, there wasn't, like, a lot of people really interested in the film festival, or they didn't market it very well. I don't right. know which one. I think it's the marketing thing. Probably the marketing <laughs> one, yeah. Three people, that's pretty pathetic. Yeah, there was <laughs> there was some funny, funny uh, films in that festival, and my friend Blake George's film was robbed because it wasn't appropriate and didn't win any awards, but it should have. But it showed. It was a good film. It was Excellent. a 22-minute film that he made. But mine, uh, I think I got Best Director and uh, Best in Fest. I don't remember what the rewards were, honestly. Right. But I remember I got two. And, like, I was super happy. And, like, that was, like, a big boost to, like, my confidence about it. And I was, like, now I look back at that film and it was really bad. Well, of course. Yeah. It's your, one of your first ones. They all <laughs> yeah. are. It's, like, your first screenplays. You're, like, oh, yeah. God, what was I thinking? Like, I broke the 180 degree rule, uh, like, 16 times oh, yeah, in, yeah, like, yeah, a yeah. scene. Well, you're not going to be Picasso just because you yeah, pick up yeah. a, a paintbrush, you know, <laughs> so give yourself a break. I mean, it's, yeah, so. it is really embarrassing. You didn't go to film school. I did. So <laughs> I got 30 films I could show you where you'd be, like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, every week it was, you had to make a film a week. So every oh week my God. you would, you literally, sometimes you'd make the masterpiece mm -hmm. and then other times you're tired. <laughs> you don't want to make a film this week, you know? So you'd, you'd phone it in and do like, oh, we're going to do this all in a master shot. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because I don't feel like doing anything else. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We were just kind of phoning it in a little bit because we had a time limit to film it. So like, sure. But I was super happy about it and winning that and like having a crowd in front of me and like, you know, my crush was in the crowd and my mom was there and everybody was like, all these people see like I won something, I can do something because up until then, like I didn't have anything to show for it. Like I wasn't doing good in school. Right. I wasn't right. like, and it was nice to have like that moment where it's like I actually accomplished something and people can be proud of me for something because I didn't do much before right. then that anybody can really be proud of me for. And like, that was kind of my moment of like walking the stage for graduation. Like instead of doing that, I had that and I could, and still am happy about that. And I just, you know, just because I didn't have that moment, like walking across the streets, that, that's why I don't regret it is because like I can have that moment again. It, it'd be a bigger deal. Like I right. can actually do something that matters and instead of graduating high school, which every other person has done. Like, yeah, it's nice that you did it, but I don't care about it. Right. And then after that, I was like, all right, well, what now? Because, you know, high school's over. I kind of have to do something. Right. So I went to community college because my mom wanted me to take some classes. So I did. And I took a film class and stuff. And I could just really tell that the teachers did not care at all. <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> what, do you, what, what do you mean? Like screenwriting class. Um, there was no teaching of screenwriting. Like if you want to learn screenwriting, you better have gone online and learned how to do it. Because really you just right. showed up every class and people just showed their scripts and we read them. And that was really good for like showing people scripts and like getting feedback. ideas and feedback yeah. from like outside people. Granted, people who don't really know that much about filmmaking if they're taking that class. Well, I mean, in terms of it didn't even teach, you know, a structure or formatting or anything I like that. I can't remember like anything from that oh, class, that's really. So I just remember like sitting down for well, like three quarters of the You know, semester. actually, my writing professor was one of the, he was the best teacher. Mm -hmm. At my film school, I love that guy. I mean, his name's Bennett Grabner, and I mean, he was the best professor I've ever had. Mm -hmm. But I can't remember anything he taught me besides about what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like he taught me how to write a script. He taught me kind of how to tell a story or how to feel a story. Right. And then he kind of went, and it's really up to you to go out and format that into a screenplay. Right. And so that's that's sort of I I had to figure that out. And I don't know if that's that was the the class that you took, but looking back, that's kind of fucked up, though. Well, I mean, it was it was fine, just because like I kind of was like studying by myself, anyways, and this is just a way for me to get out. Of the As house you should be, though. I mean, if you're a film yeah. student, if you're and if you're a wannabe filmmaker, why wouldn't you be studying on your own time too? 
Yeah, I know. You he, know, I think the best part about it was is it just showed me like all the other kids in there were pretty passionate about filmmaking, and it made me happy to see that because like. I had never really ran into a community before of filmmakers before right. I went to the community college. Right, right, right. So Was that intimidating? If, no, you, I really liked, you liked the it, fact yeah. that I could relate to people and stuff and and that it's people like, had their own ideas. And it also like it made me look at it like competition. Like oh, these right, people right. are wanting to make films, so I should make films too. Because like if they're doing that, why why shouldn't I? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then like maybe I, I, I can if theirs are better than mine, I can make mine better than they are. And you can learn from them. Yeah, and I can learn from them, and right. they can learn from me, and we all walk out of it smarter people for it. It's a healthy attitude, man. Yeah. That really is. I mean, I I can remember meeting that group of people and being intimidated only because I, I didn't see their work yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when I finally, we all got together, and we finally started watching each other's first short films, I felt better because... Oh, that person knows exactly as much as I do. Yeah, <laughs> that person knows more, more than I do. What is he doing different? Sometimes they act like they know more and they don't. Well, that's just interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean that's, that's everybody in life too. I and mean, the laziest guy in the class has the best film. Or absolutely. Something. I like, mean, there was this Russian kid in the screenwriting class who never talked, and he like had one of the funniest screenplays when he decided to share one of his screenplays. So isn't it was, that funny? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's also why I always tell people shake every hand and smile at everyone and mm -hmm. be nice to everyone because mm -hmm. you have no idea who the talented people are or who the people are that are going to be at the end of the of the finish line man right you know so you just kind of just be nice to everybody but a little healthy competition is also yeah exactly the like, best thing in the world don't make it a cutthroat competition they don't even have to know that you're competing no that's the best thing is don't make it apparent that you're competing with people and just, there's never going to be one film that is the best film of all time that's just no. not going to happen not even at your college and not, it's all taste too that's it it's all subjective, yeah, it's every, all subjective. Every, th that's why this industry is so hard because who sees your film first the people you know do mm -hmm. you trust their opinion because they like you or are they going to give you the honest truth like we were talking about yeah. with uh, with Austin? Yeah. You know, he does that for you. Who's the next kind of people? Well, probably the, you know, if you put it in front of an audience, they're still going to tell you it's it's pretty good. We really like this because you did it. Right. You know, you got to kind of break through and like you're kind of doing with the festival route with Never Be Content now, you're putting it out there and you're going to get some real world feedback. Yeah. Like it's going to be harsh and, it, that's, and that's what I need. Harsh is I great. Harsh. And you know what? the compliments that you that you get are going to be amazing too yeah they're they're really going to be from an outside source and you're going to go holy shit i didn't even think i did that well but i did that well <laughs> or they're going to say you did this really well and you're going to be like absolutely i know i did that well yeah. like i'm fucking great <laughs> but you know it's just kind of you got to manage your your own ego healthily yeah you know and and how you take things and you know i can tell you take criticism pretty well then i try to yeah i mean i don't look at it if you if you think my films suck that's fine like <laughs> not everybody's gonna like my stuff and right i totally get it like i don't like everything either yeah and yeah you know sometimes i don't like the stuff that i make either so it, i mean like i made a short film a while back that i just don't like i like all my other stuff but i just don't like that one for some reason right there's no one reason so it's like you don't like somebody's thing that's okay yeah and if there's room for help, everybody's opinions yeah and if you can help fix whatever you think is wrong then that's all the better right you know right but like in my screenwriting class my t i showed my one screenplay and it was man's memory which is i wouldn't say my high school one was my debut short film even though it was my first short film right. i would say man's memory is my first like real tackle at filmmaking and that was a 24 three minute film that i made and you I made it after the yeah. the award-winning short film yeah because i was in high school and then this is out of high school so okay, like, right, so right. like this is 2016 like february I, I wrote this script and i really liked it and so i was like all right i think this is good enough to show it to the screenwriting class and they read it and stuff and like the teacher's criticism of it was like there's not enough dialogue and there's too much action and like we didn't read through the whole script just because like there wasn't enough because everybody in the class played a character and if there wasn't enough mm -hmm. of that she I guess she didn't want to read it and, and there wasn't an, <laughs> yes yeah, so there was too much action in it not enough dialogue and uh, and so she's like you should change it and like put put more dialogue in it and I was like I don't know I'll think about it and I did think about it and I didn't end up doing it but I didn't like people said that they enjoyed the screenplay and stuff and then some people gave me some constructive criticism like this didn't make sense this didn't make sense so sure uh, after that, I did make that film, and 
that made me like realize like cemented in like this is for sure what I wanted to do because right. like it you was, showed that one in front of an audience. I remember going to see that screening. Yeah. A lot of people showed up. Yeah. You got some really, really good, you know, feedback from that audience too. It was really fun yeah. to be sitting there watching that. That one was like a really fun one to make too, just because like I had none of the resources to make it. Right. Because it takes place in like the wilderness and stuff and like in the 1980s or 70s ish. And it's like supposed to be like a coming of age, like stand by me, no country for old men type of feel like mm -hmm. those films intertwined and then i really like had to gather my resources and see like how i was going to do this because like i'd never made anything like this before so you didn't have the the equipment resources or anything like that from your school um does your school I, have equipment my, resources? my school did and i they did let me borrow thank you richard thank you for letting me borrow the uh microphone because i didn't have the microphone and right. that um, was a really nice thing to have absolutely <laughs> um yeah so, but I had my camera, which is the important thing to have. And I had people who wanted to help me make a movie, which, you know, the thing about living in a small town is people get excited over this stuff. I just was should. telling somebody that today, you know, they say, how did you make your first movie for no money? And I went, well, when you're trying to make a movie in a small town, people get, they're just so enamored by being a part of it. Yeah. They'll give you anything. I mean, they'll, they'll work for free. They'll give you their locations. They'll, they'll give you food because it's not a business. It's an art to that. Absolutely. And that's the way like it should be looked at LA. You know, it's more of a business down there because that's oh, where it is. Yeah. So like, if you want to shoot a movie in like a store in LA, they're going to charge you money. But if you do it in like a really small town, they'll probably let you do it for free. Yeah. And I just was, I was, went to people's houses cause I need a big piece of property to film on. And sometimes it's hard to come by in the right. Bay area because it's very urbanized. So you just went door to door. I went door to door. I, it was like rural places with gates. So I couldn't exactly get past the gates. Right. So I just put notes in these mailboxes and, um, this wonderful lady, Tammy called me back like three days later and she says, Oh, you can come by and look at my property. It's, uh, I don't remember how many acres it is, but it's a really, really beautiful piece of property. And uh, I went there and she showed me it and like really like it was really weird because it fit like pretty much every single scene I needed to shoot. Yeah. And, and it's like I wrote it with that place in mind like unconsciously. It was really weird. And she said I could film there for however long I want and blah, 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 blah. And then I had a character casted uh, who was supposed to play the farmer's son and he ended up not being able to do it. And I was over talking to her about the film, and I think I was like trying to get her to sign a contract to relieve her from liability or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, did she ever sign that? Yeah, she did. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and she, uh, her son walked in, Kyle, and um, and uh, I thought like she's told me she had a son, but for some reason I thought he'd be like a lot older than I was for some reason. Right. And and uh, he was he's like 26 I think now so he's not too much older than me and I was like hey do you want to be in a movie like I don't even know if you can act or not right. but you seem really cool like do you want to be in a movie and he's like yeah I'll be in your movie so I casted him in the movie so and then he ended up becoming a really good friend and like that whole group of people that I met through him like support the hell out of me making films and stuff like yeah they're probably the most supportive group i've ever had just because like they're all willing to be in my movies mm -hmm. and provide places to make movies and help out any way they can they're all awesome right. so thank you dasso posse <laughs> but um we shot that film there and like uh i think we shot most of it in two days or three days and then um I didn't edit it for a while and then I edited it and then we had a premiere like I think like 60 or 70 people came to and the theater had like luxury seats so that was like a packed house for that theater right right so um so that was really cool and then after that um I ended up making a couple other short films like my other two Man's Memory and the one that I made in high school contrary wise were like serious films I wanted to make them serious because I really love drama films right and I was like I feel like it wasn't being any fun, so I wanted to make like a cheesy 80s movie. Sure. Well, yeah, I, you, you get bored with the same genre, you yeah. know, or the same feeling. You want to see what else you can do, too. Yeah, and I didn't want to take it so seriously. Like, I'm like, let's have fun with this. So we made like an 80s style kung fu movie, Neon Snow. My favorite. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, go on YouTube. Is it on YouTube? Yeah, Neon Snow. Neon Snow by Jager Moore. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, that one makes me laugh every time I think about it. It's, it's really fun. It's a fun film. And you did, I mean, the cinematography is great. Uh, the, the fight sequences are good. So tongue in cheek. Thank Soundtrack's you. funny. 
I mean, it really is. It's a really, really good short film. It was a fun film to make. Uh, It was really long nights because we filmed that in two nights, I think, and like six a.m. or both nights. Two nights. Yeah. How long is it? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. Yeah. But that was filmed on the same property that we filmed *Man's Memory* on. So Mm -hmm. like, again, like Tammy and Kyle and like the whole crew just helped make that movie again and supported me through the whole thing and more people were in that one so that more people could have acted in it and then i made that one and like showed it at like the community college film festival and stuff and i wasn't expecting anything from it because i was just having fun making that one right but then like i was trying to think really like i want to use it as practice for like a bigger idea that i had because when i was f- i watched 13 reasons why and i'm like this is like really really depressing <laughs> right yeah and i was like this is not what high school is really like like i mean maybe it is for some people but it wasn't like this for me sure and i had a lot of fun in high school like i said so i was like and martinez is such a just a really really special place where it's like i don't really think there's any other place like it on earth they're just like really unique people here in really unique places it's like it's like from a movie so i was like i want to make a movie about this and mm-hmm. i want to make a movie about like the people that i know so I, I was really into like still am really into like 80s style stuff like i like the john hughes movies and like nice. the synth wave style music so i was like i want to use neon snow as like practice to mm-hmm. film something 80s style mm-hmm. and i think neon snow is a little too 80s for like the idea that i had but it was like good to like exaggerate it a little bit and then be able to keep well, it yeah, yeah. A bit. more so, tongue-in-cheek than you think maybe yeah you know? yeah. yeah so i i kind of wanted to just write a film that was uh, a little bit funner and more real Mm -hmm. and like based off of things that happened to me and some things that happened to other people that I know made it into a movie and it was Never Be Content which is my first feature film so it was like a natural progression for you you got you know a little bit of success here then a little bit more here and it was just kind of like the world was pushing you to make your feature film yeah I mean I was I wrote the never be content as a 50 page short film in one night and then the following night i showed it to my friends joe and kobe Mm -hmm. and um they liked it and they gave me the critiques and then i rewrote it and then like we were casting and then we had casted a lot of people for the film by then we held castings and stuff because i was taking this really serious by then Mm -hmm. and i was like damn this thing's like 50 pages long like it's really hard to do something with like a feature that's I don't even know what the hell I'm going to do with a 50 page script and with a film because like 40 minutes is like too in between to be really anything. Like right. it's too long to be a short film and it's too short to be a feature. So I just ended up like, all right, I'm going to rewrite this and I'll make it into a feature film. Cause it's like, if I'm going to throw everything I got in it, might as well just make it a feature film. Yeah. Cause well, 50 pages. I mean, you're so close. Yeah. You, know, you could write another yeah. 50 pages. It'd be good. Exactly. And that's what ended up happening. I think yeah. it was like another 60. And then we just really started going at it a little bit more. And on this one, like, you know, before I was doing everything by myself, I did the, I did the uh, cinematography, editing, dire- directing everything by myself. And on this one, I needed way more help. So like I got people who never really did film before. Like my friend Kobe, he was like my really good friend in high school and we hadn't talked for a while so I called him out of the blue and we hung out and like he helped me develop this idea a lot Mm -hmm. like I had these ideas and he would tell me which ones were good and which ones were bad and sometimes he'd throw some my way as well and um and I was like do you want to be the cinematographer for this because I need help making this and it's not like I can just go like hire people I don't have any money right like do you want to help me do this did you have any kind of budget in mind or did you just kind of like whatever money you had you're just gonna throw it into this thing whatever money I had yeah and and so like pretty much all of it went towards the equipment which was the camera yeah and um and it wasn't that expensive of a camera comparatively to other other ones so i taught him how to use the camera and he was just a natural at it and my friend damon duran he uh he's interested in film and he i met him when we were making neon snow and he helped me make that so he came came aboard and was part of the the crew he he pretty much did everything he was technically the second assistant director but he pretty much did everything like everybody did pretty much everybody did a little bit of everything and then right. you know i had like my old manager from uh the movie theater when i worked there he came aboard and was my first assistant director like one of the best classes i took in uh in community college for film was the acting classes not just because they were fun but because as a director you should know how to act or at least it feels like to be an actor being directed. Right. You got to know how to talk to actors Mm -hmm. and a good way to do that is to become one a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's a dialogue and and kind of a headspace. 
that you want to get into? I really wanted to be an actor too. And I was like, I, I was at that point where I was like, I don't know if I can do all these, but I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to do all of them. Yeah. So no better way to learn by doing it. Exactly. Immediately. <laughs> I mean, that's the, I commend you for that. You threw yourself in and you went to hell with it. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with the thing with those acting classes, I met really cool people. Yeah. And, um, and so I was able to cast people from those acting classes and then I pretty much had a recipe for a movie by then. It was just like scheduling and stuff after that. And then we finally got got to that point. But um, So at this point, script's done. Script's done. You got sort of a plan in place about what you're going to do and when and when you need to do it. It changed a million times because like some of the people are already on board and it was a short film and now it changed it. Right. So yeah, I mean like it went through a lot of changes and... I wasn't supposed to be in the movie and then I was like, you know, I really can't think of anybody else that can play this character as well as I think I can. Right, right. So I ended up doing doing that and I was like really nervous about directing and acting at the same time because I've never done that before. Yeah, that's a tough one. So um, the hardest part for pre-production for me is definitely uh, scheduling, mm -hmm. but Ryan helped me do that luckily, so it wasn't as hard. And we had a lot of days to schedule. We we had I think twenty or twenty one shooting days. Wow! It's I don't think it's really that much for a feature film either. For a first one, Is I it? mean that's pretty ambitious. Yeah, it was. It it seemed like a lot, and um, and well, so it's a lot if you're gonna do it. I think. Back to back to back. You know, if you're going to try to do it all at once, mm -hmm. 21 days is kind of a hellacious thing to do when you don't have any money. Right. You know, I can remember my first feature film, I did 21, 22 days, and I did it in three weeks. Holy shit. So crap. it was kind of like, <laughs> wow, I would never do that again. Yeah. I mean, we had zero turnaround. You know, I, I remember we, we got maybe one or two days off the whole time. And those two days literally... One was just a giant party because we just need to get it out of us. We're like, guys, we just need to get all together and blow off some steam because we've been working at this thing 10 days in a row. And then the second one was just exhaustion because everybody was just pitching in, you know, working for free, working for, you know, we're, we had good craft services. <laughs> but that was <laughs> about it. <laughs> no, God, that, that helps out so much, let me tell you. <laughs> get them some catered meals from the Olive Garden or something like that. There, there was, the shoot's actually pretty cool, you know? <laughs> it, it has a lot to the production value. It really does, man. It really does. I don't know what it is about food, but if you feed them well, it's it's almost better than getting paid sometimes. If you're not paying them, you should at least feed them, and I didn't do either, so <laughs> I'm sorry, You can everybody. apologize later. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I got a movie out of it. Ha! Yeah, I got a movie out of it. <laughs> gotcha. Hopefully one that you like being in, too. Um, <laughs> what was, I was going to say something. Um, uh, 21 days. Oh, yeah, 21 days. So... We did it over a month, so we started July 6th to August 6th. So we had some days off, and you know, most people didn't have to film every day. Right. Um, we had a big cast, too, right? How many speaking roles were there uh, in the main cast? Like, probably 20. I mean, you wrote an ensemble piece, too. That's why it's also ambitious. You wrote an ensemble piece in 21 days with, I think I can count, seven main people? Yeah. Like, if you say, like, who are the, the, the four friends... And then you had like kind of the bully kid. Then you had the, the the two girls. You had a large ensemble. Yeah, I mean it's like Days and Confuse ensemble here for for yeah. a high school movie. And you got no money, no which money. is awesome. Yeah. I mean that's it's so <laughs> ambitious. It's something that I think everybody should do because it's it's almost like put yourself on a ledge and you have to get the movie done. Mm -hmm. You know, if you start it, you have to finish it because everything's on the line. Your reputation's on the line, uh, and your ego's in line for yourself. So it just kind of has to be done. You you set the rules yourself, but you also have to meet your own deadlines. Yeah, I, well, I mean, it didn't have much choice. Like this is, I decided this is what I want to do, and I kind of screwed everything up before. Like I didn't have much option unless I wanted to start schooling all over again. So I was like, I better make this movie because well, what, I don't yeah. really have much choice. It's what you wanted to do, so yeah. you kind of put yourself in that position. Yeah, inadvertently I did it on or advertently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like there was a lot of challenges like before we even started filming, like. There's a main character, his name's Rocco. I think we casted him like three times in like the first two, like just couldn't do it for whatever reason. One of them broke his arm and he was my, Ouch. he was my friend and he broke his arm and like, that was like, I think that was a week before we started filming. Oh and then man. I, and then I, do you have any rehearsal time? We had, I think three or four script readings. Okay. So like, and then we had something. Yeah, we yeah. had something. Like everybody got to meet each other, and that was nice. Like it wasn't everybody was going in there blind. Right. 
and they kind of knew a little bit more what what I wanted from it um, after those. But, you know, there was no consistency to the character Rocco, which is like, you know, the bad boy, like greaser kid, the cool right, kid. Right. And um, and and then I got another kid who was supposed to be, he was a good actor. Um, he was supposed to play the part. And then um, he just ghosted on me. Oh, just didn't never got back to me. Like he signed the contracts, everything. I mm-hmm. told him everything. I got him the script. And this was, we were supposed to start filming July 6th and this was July 4th. And I was just stressing out. I was like, I don't have, I don't have a character. Like this guy like moves the story forward a Mm -hmm. lot. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I remembered, okay, well, Dominic from Contrera Wise, which is the film I made in high school. Mm -hmm. He's, he always told me he wanted to be in another movie and help make another movie. So I was like, all right. All right, he doesn't have any acting experience, but you know what? I can. It's fine. I can work with it. So I called him up, and I'm like, "Hey, dude, like, I really, really need somebody to play this character. And if you can do it, it'd be awesome. But if you can't, like, I totally understand. It's last minute. We're starting in two days. It's gonna be like a month shoot. So if you want to do it, you can. And then he said yes, like immediately. And all the rest of the, and he, we didn't have to reschedule one day. Wow. One day. And like all the other characters, like we had to remake the schedule. So we remade the schedule for the film like three or four times. Based on their availabilities? Yeah, because like some, for some people like who were going to play the character Rocco, like days didn't work. Yeah. And and yeah. he made every day work. And he had work to deal with in school, I think at the same time, because he was taking like some form of summer school. Right. So like he like made the movie i think like we couldn't have made the movie without that guy so what, thank you don palazzo take me back to casting in general what was the casting process like did you just know friends you know actors you know did you put out notices mm-hmm. auditions what was that like i had auditions for the main characters the three the four main characters mm-hmm. um just because like i wanted more experienced people to play those and i only casted one of those people from the casting that's because i didn't really think everybody else fit mm-hmm. i ended up i did end up casting pretty much people that i knew right but for the most part just because like i wrote the story about people that i knew already right they they just had to play themselves for the most part which was kind of like the fun part too which is like they kind of get to have fun with playing like a character of themselves even if they didn't weren't playing themselves they knew somebody they could relate to it because the story was like i i think that the story is like really like you can copy and paste it to any small town sure in this day and age and you can relate to it and that's what i wanted the story to be like i wanted it to be like a american graffiti dazed and confused for like this generation because like there's not very many of those like there's like the super bads which are really good but right it didn't really have like quite like the adolescence yeah uh coming of age feeling that like gr- american graffiti or something had so i right. kind of wanted to do that emotionally you want a little bit more invested in besides that was more of a joke you yeah. know comedy driven yours is more kind of intellectual i would say Mm, I didn't write it to be like a straight up comedy. It just kind of ended up coming out like that because of the jokes and the nature of the kids. But Mm -hmm. yeah, like I wanted to be a little bit more than a comedy. And um, yeah, so most of the people that I casted were just people that I knew. And then the people that I didn't know, like, you know, I cast them because they were good actors. Right. So um, some people from acting class, some people referred to me by other people. So um and we went through a lot of different people for characters. Like there was like a character Stoner Steve that was supposed to be played by like three different people. And then, <laughs> you know, it happens, uh, but it worked out okay just because like it's a character that I think that most people can get into the shoes of, even if you don't know how to act. Sure. Yeah, uh, I think I remember the character. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean everybody knows that guy, and that's the beautiful thing about your film. What's so relatable about it? Most everybody that you cast and everybody that you wrote for. Everybody knew that particular person, yeah. guy, gal, doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, <laughs> they were so relatable, not only to your generation, to my generation, to my parents' generation. I mean, across the book, you really captured a lot about people in a very subtle way by just presenting them as who you thought they were or who, what your recollections were of these people in high school. So that was what was so fun watching this with an audience. Because you could tell that all these different people of all different backgrounds and all different uh, generations were like, oh, man, I remember when I went through that. I remember (laughs) when I was met that guy. I remember when I was that guy, you know, so that was great. That that's one of the best things about the film is there's a nostalgia to it that smacks you in the face because it's in the script. You know, it's kind of like, what do I do with my life? That's the big question. What do I do with my life? All these people are kind of facing the precipice of the future and then. You sort of get into 
the intellectual questions of who am I? And that's where everybody kind of had, you force your audience to ask themselves who, the, who they are in this film. And I don't know if that was your intention, but that's what I thought was really impressive about it. You were forcing us to, to ask ourselves a very deep question as an audience member, and this is your first feature. Most people just put it out there and they don't know it. And maybe that question gets across and maybe they don't ask any intellectual questions. Maybe it's just a stoner comedy or something like that. But the fact that you got that across, that's, uh, that's huge. Well, I made the movie to like have those messages because like that's what I was feeling when I was making it. Like I just kind of felt like life was going in a circle at that point and I wanted to do something to change it so I made the movie and like that was what I was feeling so that's what I wanted to put into the story. Like get it out of me. I want to figure this out out. on film. In in like making the film was like a coming of age by itself. Like I could make that into a book or a film just because of all the things that happened. It's fucking brave, man. (laughs) It really is. Like I I really kind of do want to make a film about the making of it but uh, yeah, it, it um it's like the closing of like my, my childhood i think like you know i was t- 19 when i wrote it and i would turn 20 when i was making it and so you turned the page pretty yeah. much you went you know i i'm going through this ex- existential crisis and the way you deal with it is you make art and now do you think that because it came out the way it did you could turn the page if you weren't happy with it do you think you still would have turned the page and moved on I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe, but I did do what I wanted to do. I, I told the story I wanted to tell, and I told it the way I wanted to tell it. And when I walked off stage at the premiere and it was over, I felt like a completely different person. Nice. You know, like, like you'd been washed. It just felt like I finished the chapter of a book that you know I kept rereading over for a long time. It should have been finished a long time ago. Right. And it felt really good, and I'm glad that this film did that for me. And I hope it can like it did that for the people that I helped make this with. And stuff. Yeah, I think it's in, it's insanely relatable. So you're gonna turn some heads with it for sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the just the production process just a little bit. You okay. know, st- okay. So we're we got casting. You got your production schedule going. Uh, tell me, you know, when when is the first day of production and what's that like? So July six was the first day of production of 2017. And it was a disaster. <laughs> we, I didn't think about the filming location very well for that. Where and was it? It was at, at the marina downtown, which you have all kinds of trains, and that's where all the high school kids and young adults like to hang out. So, like, there was a lot of people, like, around there, for, especially for it being at night. So there was, and it's windy. So th- we just had all sorts of uh, problems with that. And, like, I remember thinking, like, God, if this is what the rest of the thing is going to be like, I don't know. Like, if I can keep people aboard for this. Because, like, I could tell, like, people were like, oh, God, is this what it's going to be like? Right. And, I, like, I was assuring them, like, I promise you, like, this is not what it's going to be like. Like, this is just, like. It's the first day. It takes a minute for it to take off. Yeah. yeah. Like, the train just got to get going. So we we did get some stuff from that night, but really we didn't get anything, like, acting-wise. Like, we got a lot of pickups. Mm-hmm. Or, or just B-roll shots of the car going and stuff. And then the second day came, and the second day was a lot better. Like we filmed uh, like the first scene of the movie, which was really kind of hard because it was a long take. Mm-hmm. So we had to do that a million times, and there was a lot of running. Involved. Did you set up your schedule sort of like a breakdown? Well, these are going to be hard days. These are going to be short days, easy days, big ensemble days. Or did you? How was the scheduling mapped out? I think we kind of did that to be what fitted everybody's schedule best, and we tried to like put things in between. Like we tried to put easy days in between long hard days and stuff and then towards the end of the film like we shot the party scenes which were the last things that we shot and like those were going to be the biggest and probably the hardest to shoot just because of the pure mass of the uh, production of it just because there was like a lot of extras there was a lot pretty much every character that was in the movie was in that scene too so yeah a lot of people were involved on that so we kind of did save the worst for last but ended up being like the funnest part and I knew that so I wanted to save it for the last part of the mm-hmm. film there was nothing easy about the film I wouldn't say there was really ever an easy day for me and my production crew the actors had a lot more fun than Kobe did sometimes because he had to hold the camera up for like hours and hours and hours without really taking a break because we have a time schedule and stuff did you physically hold it up 
Yeah, we didn't really use a lot of tripods. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. We filmed it like kind of like documentary style. Okay, release. cool. Well, you know, to his credit as a cinematographer, I didn't even notice, you know. No, no, no. He I did mean, a really good job. When you, uh, when you look at it, the cinematography, there are definitely shots that are shakier than others because that's they're an action shot or something like that. Yeah. But when you're physically just standing there, you definitely don't even notice that. Yeah. I which is to really f- great. I wanted to film it like a documentary style or like in a way where you were a character hanging out with those people. Yeah. And I thought that if, like, you were more in the face of the characters and, like, not far away on a tripod shot or right. something, it wouldn't... We had more, like, run and gun way. kind of feel to it. You know, yeah. it's like, get what we can and let's get the fuck out of here. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's... And I get related to that because some shoots that... I don't know if you can relate to this. You know, you, you start out very artsy and your shots are very grandiose and beautiful and you light it you take all the time in the world and then by like day three you're like guys set up and go we have to get out of here we have this location for this amount of time you know just shoot it shoot the damn thing you know yeah and i i don't i think you told me there was there was minimal lighting on this yeah there was not very much yeah so i mean it it sort of felt like that and to no detriment of the movie it's sort of it is that you know kind of fourth or fifth character the camera is in this mm-hmm. because you feel like you are at the low lit party or you are at the marina and there's no light and it is hard to see yeah you know so if that was a choice that's a brilliant choice well when it was because i bought the camera which we shot with the o- sunny a7s which can like see like demon magic yeah in the dark it's crazy mm-hmm. so like that helped a lot and then we did use less when we had to i wish we would have used more sometimes but it turned out really nice, and it, I wanted it to be, seem real. Like right. I wanted it to like people to watch and be like, "This is what city streets actually look like when you're walking down them at night." Right. So, so I mean, it did help a lot that we did shoot it like that, and it turned out the way I wanted it to by doing that, whether it was on accident or not. But I, I did do it on purpose for a lot of it, and then for the stuff that was too dark, we just ended up using, you know, an LED light or something. Sure, like a portable one or something. Yeah. You know, nice. One. So, so the first day is a disaster. How does it go from then on? Where can you sort of chart it from first day to where you you can stop and go, okay, this was a significant day after that? Second day nice, was pretty good. I mean, you know, um, it was long. That was, a, that was a, probably one of the longest days the second day. Which day was that? Uh, we filmed the first scene, which is where the character uh, gets egged. And then we filmed like a, a later scene where like the jocks confront one of the characters in the mm-hmm. parking lot. And um, it was just long because like the second scene, we kind of scrapped whatever I wrote into the script because it wasn't coming out naturally. Oh, for interesting. Some reason. So we kind of like all threw in our ideas for that, that scene and improvised it because there was a lot of characters in that scene that weren't in the movie otherwise. So like they didn't really have an identity. So they wanted a little bit more of an identity. So we kind of like, it turned out more comedic and better that we did that, but it took longer to shoot because of it. Cause we kind of started from scratch. Right. And because the scene wasn't really the same as it was in the script, uh, I had to like think of shots on the set. Instead oh, that's of a good question. Did you list. shot list the most days? Most days. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, the the whole thing happened so fast like product like from writing it to production that i didn't really get to shot list the whole movie beforehand Mm -hmm. so i shot listed everything for that day whenever i had time so like if we were shooting like at 7 p.m at night i'd shot list at 3 p.m and uh see if i I mean because i knew what i wanted i just didn't write it down right but it was important that we uh we knew what we needed to get just in case I forgot. On paper, yeah, for sure. Paper. Yeah, yeah. So you can look at it. I mean, you're going, you're wearing so many hats too. If you didn't have it down, there wasn't really a plan. It could just be chaos. Yeah. You know, I know some directors that work without one completely and I like to feel organically about it. But there's also directors that have a huge budget and time. And if you have time, that's a luxury that usually comes from money. Yeah. You know, if you don't have money, you need to have a clear cut plan. You need to do pre production, you know, out the wazoo. Yeah. Just so you get there and shit's gonna go wrong. You just know it on the on any kind of shoestring budget or yeah. a limited budget movie, even big budget movies, you know, but you can just throw some money at it. <laughs> but <laughs> in the limited ones you're going, Well, shit's gonna go wrong, so let's just let's just try not to get hit in the face here. Right. You know. Right. It was a little bit of planning, a little bit of improvising. Um But the second day you felt like 
redemption from the first day, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, there wasn't like as many characters there on that day, so I wish that the people Pressure was that less. were there the, the day <laughs> yeah. before I could have seen that went well. But, uh, you know, everything after that seemed like it went pretty good. Like, there were some days in between where it was like, God damn, like, I don't know mm-hmm. <laughs> about this. But there's other days where you were like, this is great, <laughs> right? There has to be. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, like, there were some good <laughs> stories from, from uh, like, when we shot at the high school. One of my crew members was drunk. <laughs> and I didn't know it until after. I'm like, what the? F- what do you mean? Mm-hmm. And like, I was afraid to watch the footage because of that. Because of it, and like, it ended up being really good. So I was like, okay, can't judge. Can't then, judge. Right? Yeah. Then. No, yeah. I guess it's good they didn't tell me beforehand. That's awesome. Probably would have rescheduled it. Yeah. That was a day that we had no shot list. Oh too. wow. Okay. Yeah, because like there was so much happening in that day that I couldn't have time to shot list it, and it was like. A montage and and stuff like that. It was like really hard for me to visualize it without being there properly because like I wasn't sure exactly which specific spots of the location we were going to be shooting at. So mm-hmm. like that, it, it helped because like when he was drunk, it livened it up a little bit more. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you don't want it to happen. Yeah, but if it helped. You know, there's no formula to all this. Yeah. It helps, it helps. And then in hindsight, we'll be like, you know, don't do that again. Yeah. But if it would help everybody, no, no, just don't do it again. Because it wasn't always like super fun, like making it like it it was a job after a minute. And like, you know, I was really stressed out. So I wasn't like always like, oh, hey, how you doing, buddy? I was like, all right, just uh, go over there. See, I'm I'm like the opposite. Even when it gets so stressful, I'll get into into like hyper parent mode where I'm like, everybody's cool. Everybody's good. I got you. Don't worry. Like I'm still like the little engine that could. But then... I also learned conflict's good for a film set too, though, especially from the director. You know, if you want to get into something, it, it's your baby, and nobody's gonna, nobody is going to stand up for you and your baby besides you, really. Right. So if you really are passionate about something and you really need to tell somebody something they, they don't want to hear, as the director, you got to do it. Yeah, you just got to get in there and have that conflict, and everybody hates confrontation, you know, but. It's your show, man. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll be a dick about it, but you kind of just have to convey that confidence. Like, my show, my vision. I know you're here helping me out for free, but it's my way or the highway, man. We had to get things done quick. So I was like, right. we don't have time to like really stop and consider like everybody and like talk to them like personally about it. I'm just like, no, I need you to go here and I need you to do that like now. Right. So there's no talk of like motivation and yeah, shit like, like that. Right, listen, buddy, I need you to go over there and I need you to uh, get that light up right there so that way we can point it down and get it on this side. You're like, no, put that can't put that light right there and shine it on him and then we'll just see where we are from there. Yeah, you don't yeah. – and it's a tough thing. You don't have time to consider everyone's feelings. You know, and it seems like that's a dick thing to say, but it's not when it's you not. have to get this train rolling. The train can't stop. It, it's – a film set thing where it's like you have to be able it's you have to be able to not take things personally on a film set you really can't and I mean like it's it's easier to say that when you're paying people though sure absolutely because they can say well I'm going home yeah you go well now I'm screwed because nobody there has to help you right nobody there has to help you they're all there out of the goodwill to help you make a movie so you really have to treat people nicely when you're making this well that says a lot about you as as, uh, your character though because if you got them all to agree to this for nothing, then obviously they believed in what you were doing. They believed in you enough to be there consistently. Yeah, you especially know? through the hard times. That was really nice to right. be able to see that. Like nobody ever walked off set. Nobody ever quit. Yeah. And uh, it was it was always like when when we were finished with the day, like we were all really happy about what we got to. Exhausted and happy. Ha- exhausted and yeah. happy. Like happy that we got to go to bed and happy that <laughs> yeah. we finished that stuff. And like I don't think we were ever like walked away from a day where we were like that written really really badly Mm -hmm. and i don't think we're gonna be able to do that again did you ever dread the next day ever like did you ever think in that schedule i just want tomorrow off yeah 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 there was there's no shame in that by the way i mean it's it's a very (laughs) real feeling it wasn't like i want tomorrow off i was just more like i'm gonna be happy when i have that done yeah I'm going to be happy when it turns out okay and like I don't have to think about it anymore. But that's a problem for future Jager, not right now Jager. Sure, yeah. So Right now Jager, (laughs) saying to future Jager, go fuck yourself. We have something to do right now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you mean. (laughs) What was the hardest day? Think about like the hardest day, the day where you wanted to quit, you know, the day that it was just, 
nothing was working besides the first day. Was there ever a day that was just so frustrating? The first day wasn't that hard and I didn't want to quit. It just wasn't going correctly. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think what the hardest day was because there was a few. Um, every time we had a lot of extras to deal with were really hard. Right, because you had some scenes, a uh, party house, you know, you had a house party. There's the, how many extras? Maybe 20, 25 extras. I would say 30. 30. 30. Wow, that's, for, the, for the party, that's awesome. we had 30 or so, maybe 40 at one point. And for the school, we had a fair amount too. Um, I think the party Seems was. in the school in, in the beginning? Yeah, in the beginning of the film when like they were uh, in classrooms. And okay, right, 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 yeah. Um, but the party scenes were pretty hard. But the, they were the hardest for me, but they were the funnest for me at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember like physically feeling like really deteriorated after like a certain amount of time being on set right just because like i had to deal with so much and there's a lot of people to rodeo up and it was somebody else's house so i kind of felt like we i had to make sure that like everything went well didn't get broken yeah shit like that oh you know isn't that a worry yeah because you're not paying for that either you know and i mean we could say this off the record on the record did you have insurance yeah i did okay cool all right all right um i had to because i had to get a a permit to right you actually did streets. you did do the permit route yeah. tell me tell me about that i mean you seem like the kind of guy that wouldn't go that route but was it just because police and you you wanted it to go smooth you know why didn't you just run and gun this and you know guerrilla film make this without the permits i could have and i would have if i didn't know these things before but but it was pretty elaborate though too yeah, well, I, 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 the thing, the reason why I got the, the, the permits and the insurance in the first place was because I wanted to film on a school. And, oh, right, right. And be, and like these scenes were important to me to get filmed because like this is how we introduce our characters. We can't just like, you know, you can't fake a school. This. Yeah, you yeah. can't fake that part. You know, I mean, you can't turn like the Breakfast Club. They did in a library, but they turned it into a school. You know, yeah. so it's like. Yeah, you, you have to go find these real places. And I really wanted to make it Martina, so I wanted to film it in the place that it happened. So, right. so I talked to the school, and I was like, hey, like I'd really like to make a movie here. And they were like, all right, well, um, get some permits. Mm-hmm. Or not get some permits, get some uh, insurance, because we need liability insurance sure. like for any event that happens here. I'm like, okay, I understand that. And so I got insurance, which is probably one of the more expensive things I spent money on for this right. thing. Well, tell our filmmakers out there that uh, they don't have insurance or they don't think they need it. You how- probably don't need it. <laughs> you probably don't. How did and, and how did you get it and what was it? I don't remember what company it was with. but Something I, you searched for online? Yeah, I just searched for it online and I tried to get it through like typical insurance agencies, but uh, it just I didn't really understand exactly what I was getting. Right. I was really ignorant about like what the hell film insurance was. So <laughs> well, I just, you really just want something on paper to show <laughs> the high school though, right? That's really yeah. the ultimate like, does this look official? Okay, here's my insurance. Well, that's what I got the, the permits for in the first place. But it was better that I had them when I shot on the streets, too, because I could just the city knew that I had the permits and the police sure. never bothered us. And sure. They were really helpful, actually. But And you got a police officer in the movie, I got a too, which, which probably helped movie. because you paid the money for that, too. Right. I was actually just friends with him and I talked to him before. Even so better. even if I didn't have the permits, maybe he I don't know, honestly. Yeah. But uh, I got the permits to film at the school and I got I got the insurance and I went back and they said, if you have the insurance, you can definitely film here. And I was like, oh, all right, for sure. So I got the insurance. And um, pretty and much all the budget went towards the equipment that I used to shoot the film and permits, the insurance. Insurance. Yeah, and permits. Yeah. I had to pay for the permits. Too. And um, So you shot at the school during the day? When did you shoot during the Was it on the uh, day weekends? And I, I did day and night. And it was during oh, the summer. Oh, it was during so summer. No okay, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing is they said no. The school after, said no? After I got the insurance. Yeah, they said you oh. can't film here. And I'm like, Why? Exactly, and they're yeah. like, "Well, because your your film shows, you know, kids drinking underage." Do they read the script? Do they need to read the script? No, I just described them a synopsis, and like they asked me wow. specific questions, and and um, I answered them honestly, which maybe wasn't a good idea. Um, and then they said no, and I fought it for a minute, and then you know, who did you have to talk to? I mean, I was going through the administration. I understand where they're coming from, but. I don't, I don't think it was like a reasonable answer for... Right. You know, I'm a local filmmaker. I, You're denying the fact that kids really do this. Yeah. You know, so it's like, we're not... 
it's we're not, not saying it's, it. Yeah, yeah, we're not saying it's great. Yeah. You can take it however you want. You know, kids drinking in movies. It's just kind of like if I was filming a documentary about uh, Martinez and the kids in Martinez and they were drinking, would I be able to film here? Is it just because I wrote this? Yeah. You know, it's like just because someone shoots somebody in a movie doesn't mean you condone it. Absolutely. You know? Like it's it, it just happens and it's what happens in the story. And I told them I wrote it out of it. And like if I wrote it out, would it would it be possible? And they said no. So I just, <laughs> so they still said no. So they still said no. And I was like, all right. So I went to the city and got the permit with them to film on the streets and that's where that came from and so then how the high school say yes didn't you film it you did it you without their authorization yeah wow <laughs> holy shit that's amazing so uh, how did that work out you just showed up with cameras yeah with extras too yeah nobody was there no you see so you descended on this like a like a crowd mob just on this school one day yep holy <laughs> shit yeah jaker that's so badass. Well, it's I mean, gonna be on they, your uh, your IMDb trivia page for sure. They said yes before, and then they said no. So I was like, "All right, well, I'm not gonna let you ruin this, so <laughs> I'll pay for it later, I guess." And how are they gonna make? They're, they're, they can't break up a flash mob. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> like, on. what are you gonna do? Call the cops? I got permits. Yeah, and then we can just run away. <laughs> yeah, and, and so. <laughs> Wow! And so yeah, what so we a did crazy that. leap that was, but that paid off like great. It looked great. I mean, it looked like you had permission. It looked like it was just a location for you. Yeah, well, the uh, inside scenes, like classroom ones, we filmed at DVC right. without permission. With Andy Drogenis, by the way. With Andy. Andy's in the movie, yeah. yeah. Andy Mr. Drogenis. Mr. Beckham, I believe he mm -hmm. plays. We filmed those, the inside stuff at DVC, just because I was I knew of some unlocked classrooms. Yeah. Class wasn't in session, but like I did my reconnaissance, and I knew that there were some classrooms unlocked. So... That one was really, like, the one that I had a hard time, like, I was really paranoid about just because, like, we were straight up trespassing on that one. Like, we weren't at outside. At DBC? Yeah, because, like, at, at the high school ones, like, it was, it's an outside school for the most part. It's not, like, a school where there's, like, a lot of indoor hallways. There's a building like that, but there's right. not, like, all building like that. So. And you don't think DBC would have said yes? I didn't want to get an answer. Like, I, I already After got, the I got Alhambra. Know. I was, like, I'm finished going through this, like, we're just, we're just going to do it. And I'll take the punishment for it if I have to. So you're going to get huge marks from the independent film community on this podcast because <laughs> so many of our listeners are indie filmmakers. They are going to love you for this story. Do you can this is the question? Do you condone other people doing this, or would you say go and do the traditional route? You can do whatever you want. It's your own free will. Just know there's consequences for what you do. But you know what? Sometimes the risk is worth the reward. With the Absolutely, War. man. And it was for me. I mean, just be smart about it. Right. Just be smart about it. Like, honestly, like, I don't care as much if it's like, if somebody who owns private property told me I can't film there and like they actually own that property, I won't film there. But right. if it's like an institution like the city or the city says I can't film on a certain street or they say I can't film at a school, like, who am I hurting personally by doing, doing that? it? You right. You know, like, right. they just want money from me. And There's no destruction of property. You're not filming anything besides talking. Yeah. Pretty much, right? Yeah. Like, I wouldn't film a gunshot, like, seen on a street without a permit or something. Unless, right, because like, that'll get you killed. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I, I've had stuff like that happen to me before. Oh, yeah. There's horror stories about that yeah. out there. So, all you independent filmmakers, <laughs> please <laughs> yeah, don't like, do that. I filmed on a, a old road that was abandoned and we were trying, like, this is like, I forgot to mention this. I did try and make a film when I was a sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped trying to make films for two years because of this. Because of the incident? Well, yeah, kind of wow. a little bit. And it, I get, maybe I got lazy about it. But back then, like, I was like, all right, I want to make a post-apocalyptic film. So we went out to this road and it was abandoned and I didn't think anything would happen. And we were dressed like, <laughs> we were pretty much dressed like terrorists and like some of us had ragged up clothes and stuff. And. Then we uh, went to uh, this road and we had a lot of stuff with us. And then someone called the cops on us and we had like a battalion of police with assault rifles. Wow. At us. Yeah. How old were you? 15. 15? Yeah. Did you just shit your pants? No, everybody else was. I'm not lying about this, but I didn't That's know fine. what they were there for because like a lot of people hike that trail. Okay. And I was like getting bothered all day. And I was like, listen, 
what do you want? Because I just saw the silhouettes of them because we were on a lower part. So when I looked up, it looked like a high noon like western scene. Right. Like just silhouettes with rifles. I'm like, what? Oh <laughs> and they're my like, what do you God. mean what? We got tickets for it. But they were pretty understanding. But don't be stupid when you're, you know, you don't got permission to do stuff. Like if you're not going to, if you're going to have not, not have permission to do stuff, be smart and very concise about every choice you make. On right. Set. Well, I mean, you see like a movie like the Battle of Algiers. You've seen that Mm-mm. just by shooting recreations of the, the the resistance in Algiers at the time, you know, in the 1950s. They're running and gunning with large mobs of people with guns. And, you know, the, the government at the time was thinking, what the fuck are all these people doing? <laughs> There's documentary cameras over there and they're all it's all fictitious. So, I mean, back then that may have worked. Yeah. But nowadays, I mean, if you pull a fake gun out. You're gonna get shot. Yeah, you know it's, yeah. it's. You have to be smart about guerrilla filmmaking in a way that there are no rules. So don't expect anybody to give you any kind of permission. Or th- you're gonna get condolences. Basically, you're gonna say, you know, I'm sorry that happened to you, but you weren't smart about it. Yeah, you just have to be really it. smart about it, especially nowadays, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you think you could go to jail, you're gonna go to jail. You if you think you're gonna not. get a ticket. Be prepared to get a ticket. Yeah. I mean, that that's, I'm always the guy that I think I can talk my way out of anything, which I have. I always think that too. You know? <laughs> yeah. But I have always talked my way out of, out of everything, but that streak comes to an end if you keep pushing it. And yeah. Keep pushing it, keep pushing it. And hopefully, I mean, nobody wants to be that kind of filmmaker forever. It just, that can't happen. You want to graduate to where people leave you the hell alone. You can film on the streets of Martinez with nobody caring. You can film at the high school. You know, you get the permits. It's not a big deal. But someone at the level that you were at when you filmed Never Be Content, that is what it's all about to me. Yeah. That's what this is all about. You know, I don't have permission. Well, I'm just going to go film it anyway. Why did I ask for, for, for permission in the first place? I mean, I was pissed they didn't do it when I got the the, the insurance. You said yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's exactly the uh, the strategy you should have taken, and you did. And I, again, that's, that is commendable, man. That's that's fantastic. Thank you. Even yeah. at the end of the film, when they're they're at the high school and they're throwing the, the toilet paper and stuff, that's all yeah. at the high school. Yeah. Well, yeah, I had to clean all that up, too. Um, I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to get the toilet paper out of the tree, and they would knew I was there filming. And it was late at night, 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. See, but you had the permits from the city. Yeah. I did mean, it like, say you could film anywhere on these permits, or did it say... No, I mean, like, you can't film on property that's not city property. So, like, I could film on the streets. Right. And that wasn't a problem. And there was a lot of stuff on the streets, so, like, that helped a lot. And you could claim ignorance, too. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I had the permits. I didn't know I couldn't go in here. Yeah, like, I could have said, right. like, I thought this was city property. Any worry about backlash from Alhambra in the future for knowing that they you use the locations? I don't know. I mean... I mean, prove it, though. Does it say Alhambra anywhere? Yes. Mmm. <laughs> it's easily edited out. You could take that out, though. You know, you yeah, could, could go in there and you sort of blur it out or do whatever you need to with that. Yeah, I just... I don't know. I mean, like, I hope they don't take recourse just because, you know, I'm just a guy trying to make a career out of myself and make a movie. And I understand that you don't want to condone stuff by giving me permission to do stuff. But I mean, you still got to make your art, man. You still got to do it somehow. (laughs) So, I mean, like, you didn't condone it. There you go. You, You did what you had to do. Your only recourse, or their only recourse, I think, would come if you were highly successful from the film, which if you were. Then who gives a shit about what they yeah. what they're gonna do against you? You know, take this out or we don't agree. Then you're already successful anyway. I mean, it wouldn't look good for them if they decided that they wanted to take action against me, anyways. Like, yeah, absolutely. Got the community behind me, and you know. And have they seen the film? They have not. And is, does they, it? I don't know. I mean, they was, in any way, do I think that this? I see that as an outsider. I don't know Alhambra High School. I don't. I just assumed you had permission, and it did not in any way take away from. Alhambra High School Mm -hmm. you know I wouldn't you didn't like piss on Alhambra High School's logo or anything like that (laughs) you know you didn't say like the Bulldogs suck or something like that I mean you were just it could have been anywhere town USA this film so it shouldn't be that big a deal if anything it makes Alhambra look really fun I know it absolutely (laughs) does and the fact that they let you film there yeah (laughs) I mean you know like support artists like 13 Reasons Why like they're filming at real schools and they 
there's everything in there. Like, there's a bathroom rape scene in, like, I think wow. season two on the school. So it's like, I don't know if it's like a money thing where it's like if you can afford for them to condone it. Usually what, what it is, man. Yeah. It's, if you had enough money to throw at them, it wouldn't be a big deal. But they never asked. Like, I would have paid the school instead of paying the insurance. They just assumed, probably. Probably, yeah. So. Or they thought, you're never going to get the insurance or the permits or whatever, so he'll, he won't come back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's like, wow, you did? That, I mean, there, there's so many more factors when it comes into people's education, children, parents, all that kind of stuff. So I'm never shocked by it. I just think it's such a great story that Thank you, you just went in there and did it anyway. <laughs> I mean, that shows what I would call chutzpah. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome, man. So towards the let's let's finish up production. So you you talk about the the hardest days. What's your best day? The one where you just were you went home just energized, juiced, you knew this thing was going to finish or you knew it was going to turn out the way you envisioned it. We filmed uh, I think three nights of the party scene and um the first night we finished that which this was like towards the end of the filming too but the first time we finished the, the filming there i was like yeah this is gonna be good this is gonna be really good. at the party scene what made you feel like that i don't know i mean the people that showed up to be extras and stuff like they all came out and the fact they did show up yeah because you know it, it, it's really hard to get extras when you don't you're not paying anybody in just actors in general but like these are people who aren't gonna talk they're not really going to get any credit in the movie. Right. Like they don't even know if they're going to be in the movie basically too, or do they not? Maybe they don't even know that because they've they've never been an extra before. Yeah. But I think that's what people wanted to see was just how a movie was made and just be a part of it. And it was really cool because it really kind of was like a party. Like people were just hanging out, talking and stuff, but you know, there wasn't really any drinking. I'm sure there was. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm, you know, sure, come I'm on, sure you had other things was. to worry about, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, but if there was, everybody was cool about it. Right. But, um, when I when I went home that night, I was just like, that went really nicely. Like, despite all the stress and everything that I have from that, because I have to coordinate it all, it was really really nice just to be able to like. That's why like the, all the other days after that, like even though they were hard, I knew they were going to turn out good. Yeah. Um, and it felt like a real party. That's what, like what I, because everything else was like it was. It, you know how like making movies is it's hard to like see if it's gonna feel real or not when you're actually watching the movie but when I was watching right. stuff happen at the party scenes when it was happening it felt real like the interactions between people felt real the people doing stuff in the background felt real it was just a breath of fresh air yeah I know exactly what you mean actually you get something that you you set out to to get or even stuff that surprises you yeah and you know you can see light at the end of the tunnel for some reason I think the thing that helped out the most was um, like most of the places we filmed weren't really like a controlled environment. Like we were filming on the streets a lot. Right. We couldn't control like when people walked down the street or drove down the street and stuff. And we couldn't like push like what what na- ha- the, the patience of like neighbors and stuff. So so when we were at this house filming the party scene, like we had full control of what was happening in the party in in, in the house. So. So it was nice to be able to not have to stress out about it as much. I mean, you still have to stress out about how long you can keep these extras here, but um, it wasn't as big of a factor. Right. Like everybody seemed like they were having fun. I was having fun, even though I was stressed out. I was having a lot of fun. And then the last day. The last day of filming was, uh, we filmed outside the party scene, so like the characters get kicked out of the party, and then they just talk oh that's the last day okay that was the last thing so on believe. when they're walking down the streets no not that like la- they're they're just talking outside the party oh, outside, that they outside the doorway out. okay yeah so that was like it was really small stuff like we saved something really easy for the very last day. smart yeah so um we we filmed that stuff and like we goofed around a lot that night because like we knew it wasn't going to take that long so we yeah. had a lot of fun that night and then uh we wrapped it up and everybody went home and we had our killer killer party a week later nice a cast party and stuff so that was a lot of fun and then the editing begins right or did you take a little gap in between that as you should have i did longer than i should have honestly i was telling everybody hey you know this will probably be done in december we'll probably have a premiere in december january right and this was what august July? 6th oh, august yeah, august yeah. 6th so we finished filming august 6th and then i took a break from august to November or mm-hmm. December. I, I, listen, man, I, that's exactly what anybody would have done. 
I don't think I'll ever do it again though. Like not having anything to work on and like feeling like you have all the work ahead of you still. Like, yeah. It's, it, it's, it, I don't know. Like you want, I want to finish it mm-hmm. and I should have finished it earlier. But so I finally kicked myself in the gear around then and then, um, edited it for three or four months and then three or four months. Wow. Yeah. That's how long did you, was this a, a strict editing schedule or did you take, you know, a day here, a day there, whatever you could afford? I was trying to keep it strict, but sometimes I couldn't make it on those days and stuff. But I was yeah. trying to get at least three or four hours in a day and put more in if I could. It went through a lot of different cuts too. Mm-hmm. Um, how long was the first cut? It was always nine, or I think the first one was 100 minutes. Really? It yeah. wasn't like this seven hour cut, you know, that no. sort of all the footage. The script was, I think, 115 pages, and then it ended up being 90 minutes. And wow. it, it was just lucky that it ended up like that. So your ratio wasn't like four to one or anything like that. You just kind of filmed whatever you needed. Yeah. In, in like, it was a lot of dialogue in the film. So, like, this, the pages went by quicker. Yeah. You know, because they say a page uh, every minute is right. a page. Um, but I cut out a lot of scenes and stuff, and I was trying to like make certain things that I didn't think work work, and mm-hmm. I think that that helped by like you know having different reactions to things and cutting things to uh, a different reaction. Like you know, I don't know. It, it made it made sense when I was thinking about it, but um, I was just I just wanted to be happy with it, so like I was just taking the time necessary. And I didn't want to rush it, and then after that, the sound was a disaster. Oh, the sound was a disaster. And uh, my friend Alex, he um, he let me borrow the microphones for uh, for the film um, to to use as like the boom operators and stuff. And he wasn't the boom operator. My dad was actually for the whole film. <laughs> um, but uh, he said he would help me uh, do the sound for the film because like I'm not like really experienced with sound. Like I do the sound for all my other films, but like this is really big. Right. And uh, I didn't know if I could do it. And he's a sound engineer, so I was like, yeah, if you want to help me, that'd really be cool. And I was like, I don't know what you're get- if you know what you're getting yourself into. And he's like, oh, it's fine. He didn't know what he was getting himself into, I don't think, because it was a lot of work. Like, oh, better was. We, he was working on it all the time. and Trying to clean it up, trying to yeah. uh, crossfade it. I mean, you had to do ADR, I would assume. ADR, yeah. Like, there was a lot of work that had to be done. And, like, we went in there, and we were meticulously choosing everything that had to be fixed and then like when we thought it was fixed we'd watch it three or four more times and find something else yeah and uh and uh, it was a lot of work doing that i think that was like probably the longest stretch of time that it took like post-production wise and how many cuts do you think you uh you went through complete for that i think six six wow i mean there wasn't like a huge difference between cuts but i mean the quality of each yeah, cut yeah, got yeah. significantly better and then simultaneously his brother was doing the color correction and visual effects for the film Mm -hmm. um because like uh, i did color correction for my other films but he was a lot more experienced and he said that he'd really like to help out so um it it was really nice that these two brothers lived in the same house i didn't have to go like drive super far to like go to one part of post-production like i just would go to the next room and like somebody else was working on the film so it was like a studio it was kind of cool yeah um but he was working on it and um me and the his name's Nick, the guy who colored it, um, and he, uh, me and him went over the whole film a few times and went over like how we want each uh, scene to look for the film. Uh, I wanted it to have like an '80s style color grade look where it wasn't super contrasty, maybe sometimes a little bit washed out, and um, and then add some grain to it, and um, and then he added like visual effects like all the visual effects are like really subtle like taking reflections out one of the hardest visual effects was making wet paper towel look like an egg oh wow because at first scene i think we was an egging scene and we couldn't throw real eggs at the house and uh we threw wet paper towels and it really looked like eggs (laughs) (laughs) so he uh he made them look like eggs that was kind of like for some reason difficult for, for I tried to do it for hours by myself and he ended up making it work really well so awesome yeah so that was what post production was like and it was like one of those post productions where it's like we have like a day for the premiere and we have to have it done and like we made changes like I think a day up till the premiere no absolutely yeah this is the way it goes yeah you know you put yourself on the tight deadline but you're gonna use absolutely every minute of that deadline yeah yeah so 
Yeah, it was um, post production was quite a lot. I would even say it was harder than making them like shooting the movie. Cause at really? Least, yeah, I'd say it was harder just because I like being around people. Yeah. And you're not being around people as much when you're making locked in editing bay, man. Yeah. Mm. Did you edit it yourself? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 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 What did you use? Uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretty well versed on that now. Yeah. After so many hours, <laughs> yeah. I would imagine. I've been using it for a few years. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I like it a lot. Absolutely. Final Cut or anything like that. So you do color correction. You have somebody come in and do the audio titles. I did the titles myself. My older sister Samantha, she made uh, the the art for the film. Mm hmm. So um, she drew all the posters, and uh, I think we had like we had one main poster, and then we had uh, three side posters of like individual characters and stuff, and that took her a while to do too. So there was a lot of work like involved in like the whole post production thing. I wanted there to be a good poster for the film because like you know that's what makes people want to watch movies. Oh, and it's it's great. I mean, she did a great job on it. I see why you sold so many at your premiere for sure. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a great poster. It did turn out really really well. So okay, so what's the plan now with it? It's in the can. You had your premiere. You showed it to what about a hundred people? Two hundred. Two hundred people. people. We were there. That was a great night for you. Full uh, sold out crowd. Huge response. What's next for Never to Be Content? Uh, right now, I'm in the process of putting it in the film festivals. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been like on the festival circuit like this. I mean, because I put like some of my other short films in the festivals, but like not really even to the extent that I'm doing this one. So I'm doing that now and uh, seeing where I can take it and hopefully showing more people about it. And, you know, I want to hopefully be able to make it uh, like more widely available for people pretty soon. So we'll see how I can get that going too. And what's next for you? I'm wanting to make another feature film. I'm writing a couple stuff right now. And um, in between me writing it and me making that film, I want to make some, uh, maybe some more short films. But, uh, Goal right now is to make another feature. Hopefully make it bigger and better. Biggest advice out there for independent filmmakers, people that think they want to get into film, what would you tell them after making your first feature film? Just pick up something and do it. Um, you don't really have an excuse not to do it anymore because you have an iPhone which has a camera and a microphone on it. And if you think you want to do it, just try it out. Right. Um, be an extra on like a film set or something and see how it really works on because you know Hollywood works a lot different than you know small post small productions do but um if you want to make a feature film just do it because I didn't plan on making one but you if you just put your mind to it and write it the right way you can make it for really really cheap and if you have people that are willing to help you there's nothing stopping you at that point and if you can't come up with ideas go for a walk <laughs> that's, that's what I always did Still and do. you follow what I absolutely tell Everyone that asks me, write what you know. Write what you know, and then experiment with what you don't know. Absolutely. Pick up a camera, shoot it, and that is our biggest mantra on the podcast. People know that. They love that about us. There's no wrong way to make a movie. There's no rules. Pick up a camera and do it and see how good you are. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to make like a beautiful work of art the first few times, and that's okay. Like, You got to work your way up to it. And you don't have to go to school to do this. Like, you can literally just decide one day I want to make a movie and make a movie. That's, and that's fine. Because a lot of the good filmmakers did that. You don't have to go to film school. It doesn't have to be like a formal education like everybody says. Like, if you're already good at painting, why well, go to school for it, right? Absolutely. Just paint a picture. Paint a picture and then keep getting better at painting. Don't ever feel like you're too good. You're good enough, you know? Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. yeah I mean, if, if, you, if you're really satisfied with your work and, like, you don't think it's bad, then maybe you're not you you you're not done growing. You need to keep you're never done growing as a filmmaker. You're always not going to be completely satisfied with your stuff. So as long as you hate your stuff, you're probably doing good. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I like my stuff. So that's why I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, man. Jager Moore, you're a, truly a class act. You made a wonderful film. I'm really glad that I talked to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. That was filmmaker Jager Moore and myself, Nathan Robert Blackburn, for the Four Seasons of Film podcast. Uh, check us out after the Oscars. We're going to be back for the spring edition. I know the dreaded spring edition of film and uh, the movies that will come out during the spring season. I think uh, Captain Marvel is going to lead the charge. 
But uh, more more of that wonderful ilk of movies and other movies. Usually we, we like to cover all indie movies during the spring and even bring back uh, Andy Drogenis for a slew of new crap night movies or the movies we don't want to see, but uh, we make him see. Check us out at fourseasonsoffilm.com for all your podcast needs. New episodes every Tuesday and Four Seasons of Film TV every third Thursday on Vimeo. I want to thank you uh, once again for listening and I want to thank Jager Moore for being here on the podcast. Go see his film Never Be Content Thursday, March 14th at 7 p.m. at Diablo City College in Pleasant Hill, California. Keep film alive.